Hello, everyone, and thank you so much, Leslie and Omar, for welcoming me into this uh, very generous ideas space. Um, I look forward today to basically just sharing with you some um, questions, thoughts, uh, perspectives that have been on my mind as I've spent some time working with a particular set of uh, visual cultures, particularly in the Danish context. I've left the Danish context now, but I think looking back, it's still useful to think through um, how this helps us to um, imagine what to do with this uh, ongoing archive of ideas and images which we are left with in various contexts. So let me begin. Uh, first, uh, I want to uh, acknowledge, because now I live in Seattle and I'm a member of the University of Washington, I want to acknowledge the Coast Salish peoples of this land the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Suquamish, Tulalip and Muckleshoot nations. And because today is, um, well, for some of us, some people have already left it in terms of time, but because today is International Women's Day, I also, on top of this, want to honor and give thanks to all those women, past and present, who have worked to ensure that there is indeed an afterward. So as a prologue to this talk, I want to begin with three impressions, provocations, if you will, which sketch the lines around the substance of this talk. First, an image of my mother that I often draw strength from. During the 1990s, my mother started an evening course in doll making and began to make a collection of dolls representing tribes from different parts of the African continent. This creative practice was one aspect of her many efforts to curate the images my sisters and I were surrounded by and exposed to when we were growing up in London. I look back now and understand my mother's doll making as a deeply poetic gesture a decolonial gesture, seeking to create beautiful and cultural images in an environment that did not quite know what to do with the black body and representations. Gestures filled with healing ointment for all those moments when we would approach the makeup counter or pick up a magazine and not see ourselves reflected back. My mother tended to her dolls in the same way she continues to tend to plants or craft wholesome meals. In all this work, she is, as Alice Walker writes, radiant, almost to the point of being invisible. Except as creator, hand and eye, she is involved in work her soul must have, ordering the universe in the image of her personal conception of beauty. Her face, as she prepares the art that is her gift, is a legacy of respect she leaves to me for all that illuminates and cherishes life. She has handed down respect for the possibilities and the will to grasp them. The second impression I share is similarly concerned with a spectrum of visibilities haunted by history. In 2019, Deb Raji, a, Toronto, a researcher at Toronto University, in collaboration with the MIT Media Lab, published the findings of a study they had been conducting on algorithmic bias in all the major facial recognition softwares. They found that Amazon's new software, which is called Recognition with a K, regularly mistaken the faces of dark-skinned women for men, at least 30% of the time. Now, this is not a new debate in the tech world, and we know from the amazing work of people like Ruha Benjamin, Safia Noble, Joy Bualamumi, and the Algorithmic Justice League, we know from their work that inequity is encoded in technology design. But here, I want to draw your attention to the marketing images produced on Amazon's website. They are still there which are an attempt to overemphasize the inclusiveness and accuracy of their software. So the black woman you see here is indeed, quote unquote, 100% female, according to computer vision. Of course, in this emphasis on accuracy, 
their language of categorization and assessment problematically replays binary logics, gendered and racialized troping, which will at some point inevitably lead to other kinds of exclusions. This of course is with the deep read. And with Google uh, recently producing its own reconciliatory advertising with the Pixel 6 camera, which is now being marketed as having the ability to see darker complexions in quote, real tone. With all this, uh, that's got me thinking about where we go from here. If the future is indeed filled with empathic robots and driverless cars, then accurate recognition will be a literal matter of life and death. And yet, as we are more increasingly surveillanced, it becomes necessary to speculate about escaping the field of vision. So what then do we choose? Visibility or invisibility? High definition or blur? skin feeling, to be constantly exposed as something you are not, to be uncomfortable, stunned, hot, in places where the air gets smaller, a nightmare of visibility and repetition. If you haven't already, I highly recommend reading this article, uh, Skin Feeling by Sophia Samata, and I'll put the link in the chat later. The third impression that I want to um, enter into this space pulls the desire for enriching representations and questions of ethical viewership together. Over the last year or so on social media, there has been a whole range of augmentation softwares and technologies focused on bringing the past, the dead, back to life. For example, the trend towards colorization of sepia photographs, which is something that this Brazilian artist Marina Amaral does professionally for companies. Frederick Douglass, as 19th century America's most photographed political celebrity, appears in these practices regularly. Yes, he consented to occupying the space of image and also wrote about photography uh, a number of times. But how we are choosing to play with his image in the present is something I have also been wondering about. Is there an ethics of conversion here that needs to be unfolded? Or are we simply covered by Creative Commons 2.0 remix? Perhaps later in the discussion, we can talk about myheritage.com's employment of deep fake technology to body jack. And by that, I mean to forcibly inhabit and control movement to body jack photographs of those we have only known in still but of course, very moving images. In this talk, I want to explore the concept of portraiture in a colonial context, not simply as a visual negotiation of likeness or images through which subjects are held in stasis and encounter audiences by way of asymmetrical looking acts, but more importantly, engaging with the portrait itself as a scene of entanglement, a contact zone to borrow the infamous words of Mary Pratt, where subjects get constituted in and by their relations to each other. And that includes us in the present day researchers and so on and artists and so on a contact zone where cotton, silk, iron, sugar, salt, rice, cinnamon, indigo, blood, dust, faith, trade, and the law rub up against black bodies of evidence. Early modes of colonial self-fashioning were biased by design. And here is a typical 18th century portrait that I often return to in my teaching because I think it's very useful of kind of demonstrating the aesthetic hierarchies that were kind of put forward in this kind of image making. 
It represents an English noblewoman called Lady Grace Carteret, um, who is, you know, one of many uh, elite ladies of the 18th century. The obvious compositional ordering of human relations in her household are clear. Mother holds her child, child strokes the parrot, black servant holds the parrot, dog is in the background. Devotion and loyalty are signaled through the eyes. But more subtly are the ways in which the African child status as colonial property is additionally implied through mirrored accessories. Lady Grace with a pearl necklace and the child with a silver chattel collar uh, and a little bell attached. And that was an early form of monitoring and surveillance. Interestingly, Lady Carteret's lapdog does not have a collar. This kind of iconography is, um, is indicative of the aesthetic techniques that codified African bodies as property in European portraiture during the early modern period. Property trapped in materials like paintings, prints, ceramics, silverware, and so on. These African presences also served as a form of visual citation, pointing indexically to all the imperial gains being made away from home. Colonized people imagined in art and visual culture were subject to multiple erasures or what Edouard Glisson describes as the deterioration of, of personhood. Agnes Lugo Ortiz and Angela, Angela Rosenthal wrote in their introduction to a whole volume of essays on slave portraiture about the profound paradox of the portrait as a technology that projects fantasies of domination onto unfree bodies, resignifies slavery as aesthetics, and traps images of real people into permanent subjection. They ask, if portraiture as a genre in its most pre-avant-garde fashion has been understood as demanding that the viewer grant a subject reality to the image made visible on the canvas, right, that somebody was there. What then are the particularities of the dynamics of visualization and subjectification that underwrite the portrayal of enslaved beings whose conditions of existence and visibility have historically been under erasure? So in other words, what does it mean to be made visible through various materials, but at the same time erased at the level of being? What I'm getting here is the kind of alienation or disembodied gaze, uh, to use the words of Simone Brown in the context of technology, that steals a subject from themselves. And we can think back to that skin feeling that I mentioned earlier that steals a subject from themselves, that reduces a subject to pigment, fragments, and citation. So this colonial paradox of absent presences is also tied to issues of ownership and consent with consequences for our use of this material in the present day. Some of you may have heard in the news about the lawsuit filed by Tamara Lanier, who's shown here, against the Peabody Museum at Harvard University. Lanier professes to be the descendant of a man called Renty, who was the eldest of seven enslaved workers on a South Carolina cotton plantation photographed in 1850. Renty, Delia, Jack, Drana, Jim, Alfred, and Fesena were all photographed naked by Joseph Zeely, who was commissioned by Swiss glaciologist Louis Agassiz, then a professor at Harvard University. 
Agassiz was promoting racist science and segregation in the US at the moment, in that very moment when the country was grappling with the problem of slavery. The photographs were part of his polygenism theory project, the idea that um, human beings come from distinct original races rather than from one source. Harvard University now owns the, the Gora types and charges a fee for reproductive rights in books and other commercial merchandise. The photographs are not currently on public display, but they have recently been the subject of a very weighty and extensive volume called To Make Their Own Way in the World. As, but one thing that the book does not talk about is Lanier's claim. As a living descendant of Renty and Delia, his daughter, Lanier has been asking for her family's property back and also challenging Harvard to desist from continuing to profit on enslaved bodies. She and her lawyers argue that Harvard are perpetuating the dynamics of slavery, which denied African-Americans the right to own, claim, or inherit property, but also to maintain deep familial ties that allow for a legacy to be passed down. Now, despite the fact that living descendants of Louis Agassiz, Swiss and American, um, supported Lanier in her claim, the case has been acquitted. They did this on moral grounds as opposed to legal grounds, precisely because of the legal framework around property rights, which have been unable to bend in this ethically sensitive case. But the issue of legal personhood, as it intersects with privacy, cuts to the heart of the portrait as a documentary genre. Because the question of who gets to be seen and represented on their own terms is still embedded within colonial hierarchies of rights and value. This is all part of what Saidiya Hartman calls the afterlife of property. So how then can we claim the lost ones back, restore their dignity? Do we, for example, stand in their place, as many artists, including Ayana Jackson, have done? Or do we offer our bodies as surrogate storytellers, like the work of Sasha Huber here, but also much like Lanier has actually done in the absence of official records? Or do we transform these image encounters through alternative viewing strategies like Barbara Walker has done, breaking with conventions of scale, with foregrounds and backgrounds, perspectives and vanishing points? Or do we attend to the gaps, misrecognitions and scars with threads, patches and soft touches, a new poetics of care? And many of you will, of course, know the work of Bisa Butler, who makes these amazing quilts responding to this archive of some known and many unknown individuals. OK, so that's my kind of, you know, the, the, the sketches around some themes. Now I want to spend a moment engaging with one particular portrait an important newly revealed portrait, engaging with it as a scene of entanglement by first unpacking the turn of events that brought the, pub, the painting into the public domain in Denmark during 2017. And just for clarity, I don't really like using maps, but just so you know where we are, uh, Denmark is just, I just circled it in yellow here, um, which is part of uh, Scandinavia and the Nordic countries, just so we know where we're thinking, but also to give you a sense of scale. So in 2017, Denmark commemorated a hundred years after the sale and transfer of its former Caribbean sugar colonies, St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, to the United States in 1917 for $25 million in gold. This is the check from the National Archives in Denmark. This annexation of colonial territories on the cusp of the First World War marked a significant turning point in a colonial saga that was by then centuries old. 
Since 1672, the Caribbean islands were purchased incrementally over time to eventually become a key part of Denmark's increasing global interests in West Africa, India, China, and Greenland, which although operating through home rule is still part of the kingdom. There were critical moments of unrest during the colonial period in the Caribbean specifically. Emancipation of slavery in 1848 came as the result of a rebellion by the enslaved population, and not simply um, by way of the benevolence of Governor Peter von Schulten, who's often painted as a great liberator in more traditional narratives. And that's a long story because he also had um, a Creole partner that had um, uh, a lot of influence in his decision making and feeling towards enslaved people. Uh, but that's for another time. So in 1848, emancipation of slavery came as the result of a, a rebellion from the enslaved population. And in the preceding years, a labor dispute on St. Croix in 1878, known on the islands as the fire bun, saw legally free but exploited workers destroy plantations and property in protest of inhumane conditions. One of the women leading this revolt, hailed Queen Mary Thomas by the community, was eventually imprisoned in Copenhagen in 1882, along with three other women, Axeline Salomon, Mathilde McBean, and Susanna, Susanna Abramson. Queen Mary has become an important figurehead for liberation struggles, particularly on the islands. And she's the subject of a monument, the first of its kind in Scandinavia, by artists Jeanette Ellers and Lavorn Bell, which you may have heard about or seen in the art news. I Am Queen Mary, which is the name of their statue, um, is monumental connective tissue, holding the memory of these colonial relations in place as a stay a fixing ceremony, to use Toni Morrison's words, a stay against forgetting. But it is also a fabulation, a hybrid image or bodily presence produced in place of a portrait of the real woman that we cannot yet find. And this is despite Denmark's propensity for documenting everything. Historically, this release in 1917 of people, property and land marked a significant shift in consciousness about Denmark's colonial endeavors. And over time evinced sentimental views of the Caribbean as a former paradise and Denmark's role as both successful and benevolent. So 2017 was a very unusual commemorative event because it was not a celebration of moral victory of abolition or emancipation rather a moment for Denmark to both remember the loss of its former islands and all of the imaginary worlds uh, that the tropics conjured, but also to institutionalize transfer, its sanctioning of forgetfulness and rescinding of accountability for present day legacies. So, as you can imagine, during this time, there was a lot of intensity, a lot of intense feeling um, and also discomfort in the public debate. There was denial, defensiveness, hostility, insistence that the past was a finished project, and a constant centering of Danish perspectives and feelings as the only ones with value. And, you know, this might sound familiar to you because this happens in so many different contexts around addressing um, unfinished histories. And there was also nostalgia, and of course, the accompanying melancholia that can, of, can often come from separation anxiety. And it's a, a, a melancholia that was not just present in that de debate, but also articulated through visual cultures during the period. I didn't want to show you the ugly racist tone of this cartoon, but here in the detail, you literally see Mother D Denmark weeping as uh, America takes away her Caribbean babies. So at the same time as there is this kind of difficult and uncomfortable grappling with what was, uh, Danish cultural institutions were in the process of digitizing and open sourcing their collections, which revealed the very things that people were too uncomfortable to deal with, revealed intimacies and entanglements that could not be so easily set aside because they were forms of evidence. 
images, curated and private photo albums, which memorialize this period as a happier time and the master servant relationships with the Afro-Caribbean community as loyal, obedient and enduring. Um, the inscription um, on this photograph reads, Dear Jens, here you see a picture of our cook and our boy. Aren't they beautiful? The boy is completely black, the chef a little lighter, almost coffee brown. So this is an interesting example of the aesthetic judgments being made by Danes about black people working for them and living around them. The photographs functioning as references that explain, um, to put it crudely, the colonial color palette, if you will. Okay, so it's in this context during 2017, you've got the long history of colonial implication, the dissonance and uncomfortable feeling wrought by remembering it, and then the reawakening of this material in the digital domain. It's in this context um, that when the memory of Danish colonialism was being reconfigured, that the oil portrait of a young Afro-Caribbean woman by Wilhelm Maastrand appeared as if by magic out of the vaults of the Maastrand family private collection into the commercial commons of the art market, appeared in order to be seen, but, order, but also to be traded. And in that trading, reawakening old principles of value and taste and reducing the black body once more to the status of thing, a bind which even in our attempts at historical redress, we cannot seem to escape. The painting sold for 900,000 Danish kroner, which is about $100,000, $120,000, and is now on view um, in the permanent collection of the Statens Museum for Kunst in Copenhagen. For I cannot appear by myself, or to myself, unlike the sensory acts of seeing and hearing. Appearing is a social event, writes Nicholas Mirzov. It is a common encounter between myself and those to whom I appear. But all those present do not necessarily agree as to the meaning of that appearance. So how does this young woman appear? The question, who is the subject, which is the title of this talk, is really a provocation to think doubly about the possibilities for extracting Black biographies from the archives, whilst at the same time providing a healthy and a necessary ambivalence about what is gained and lost in attempting to pull lives out of colonial storehouses. Lives that appear to us in bits and in pieces and usually without a satisfactory ending. So who are we looking at? The focal point of our attention is Justina Antoine, a young woman from the island of St. Thomas. She's represented here in Copenhagen with the daughters of the artist brother. Otto Jakob Mastrand was a Danish timber merchant who had migrated to St. Thomas in 1830 and later became the Swedish Norwegian consul there. He and his wife, Anna Dorothea, who was born on the island, had four children together. Annie and Emily, who you see here with Justina Antoine, Oswald, the young figure in the distance, and Wilhelm, the last of whom died shortly after they arrived in Copenhagen. Now, thanks to the work of my colleague, art historian and PhD student, Nina Kramer at the University of Copenhagen, we were able to name Justina Antoine fully. And this is so important. I have to underscore this like five times. In other words, not to rely on the singular names, which in so many instances with black figures and models in the history of art, imply a familiarity and a closeness which we have not yet earned. Singular names that separate subjects from the possibility to forge or uncover 
family connections. Dracina Antoine is listed as a servant living with the family in both the 1850 and 1855 census on St. Thomas at number 39 Neur Street in Charlotte Amélie. Here in 1850, Justina Antoine is 18 year, years old, unmarried, and a Lutheran. In 1855, Justine Antoine, with a double E, is 22. Between the slippages of colonial record keeping, we can at least be sure that she lived for some time with the family and may have been born enslaved in their care. The family decide to move to Denmark for a brief change in climate in 1856, perhaps also due to the cholera, to a cholera outbreak on the island. This is when Wilhelm came in contact with Justina, whilst she attended to his brother's wife and children in Denmark. Already an artist with a thriving portrait practice, it makes sense to suppose that Wilhelm Marstrand used the unique opportunity of his brother's arrival to produce a sensitive portrait of a young woman caught between worlds, almost a decade after emancipation of slavery. Poised, humble, coy, reserved, uncertain, questioning. These are some of the words I could use to describe how this young woman reveals herself to and is seen by the artist. He represents her not on the margins, but at the center of what is actually a family portrait in between the two children she is tasked with looking after with the rest of the family walking in the distance behind. Set in Fredericksburg Gardens, the public park in the suburbs of Copenhagen, she too is involved in the quiet performance of social mobility that marks these spaces uh, in Denmark in the 19th century. Her performance is aesthetic and gestural, arms crossed and composed. She is dressed in Sunday best in a simple white dress and madras head wrap, a familiar colonial outfit that marks this young woman as coming from elsewhere while still maintaining a view of her as chaste and unspoiled. And this costume is something that Steve Buckridge has researched extensively in the context of Jamaica. The red shawl that is wrapped over her shoulders also has the curious effect of morphing her outfit into a version of the red and white Danish flag known as the Danborg. Entangled in the private life of the Marstrand family, but also in the geopolitics of property and territory, she appears as woman and servant, but also anthropomorphically as the islands themselves. And so it is through her that these colonial outposts emerge as stable, controlled, youthful, a caretaker and sustainer for the next generation, obedient, all qualities that were wished for by Danish officials. In this way, she is proposed by the artist as a signature for the future ses success of the colonial project. Now, it may be that this is a highly inflated reading of this portrait, but of course, these are some of the ways that black models are often called into cultural labor, standing in as a bearer of values in this kind of visual culture. But the portrait also participates in a small visual tradition in Danish art and later photography of representing colonial nannies as a particular kind of caretaker. This is uh, Neki, we don't know her last name from 1838. Women who also appear in Danish literature as the doting subject who cannot say no and love unconditionally, tuck Danish children into their beds at night and watch over them as they sleep. And in some instances in novels, you have them sort of waving palm leaves over the children so that they stay cool. These women in fiction are discussed in an excellent article written in English by Ursula Lindquist called West Indian Women in Danish Popular Fiction. And I can also provide a link for this later. Okay, so I have to admit that increasingly I'm finding it very hard to tell the stories of these artworks in this very formal 
art historical contextualized way. This is my training, but of course, um, it's difficult because it's a kind of constraint as well. Um, even though I think this is important for figuring out, you know, where we are in space, in time, in material, in an artistic context. But I feel that even in my telling, I reinscribe certain values. I repeat structures of being and feeling and also alienation. It is just too easy to get stuck between a fragmented biography. Everything that I've told you is all that we have so far. It's too easy to get stuck between a fragmented biography and the painted surface of this young woman's skin. Retrospective anecdotes reveal that the two children remembered their nanny in older age, although not in any significant detail enough to give a sense of who she was as a living, breathing entity. For them, she was just there, and I literally quote from their words, their black maid. But I want to know what I want to know from the past, from, the, from now, from the future, looking back. But I want to know about the conversation between Art Marstrand and Justina Antoine, if there was one. What emerged between artist and sitter in their quiet act of co-creation? I, I really do hope you agree that they have co-created co this image together. It is not just the artist's skill. Was their meeting like the one photographed here between Henri Matisse and the Haitian dancer Carmen Lenz in 1946, a meeting which Matisse was incredibly grateful for. Once again, how does Justina Antoine appear? Justina Antoine is one pair of so many painted and engraved eyes that look back at us now and insist on our attention. They look back and reference a human to human encounter. They look back, but also away from the scene of history, often from the scene of a crime. How we describe their presences, what we do with their images, the stories that we choose to tell or not tell, our emphases and points of contact, these are the tasks left before us after the fact for reckoning, remembrance, but also connection. And with this still very haunting image of Justina Antoine, I will end this talk and open up for questions and say thank you for your time and attention. <laughs>